I came to anthropology from a multidisciplinary perspective because I was studying literature and I was studying Iran and I kind of put the two together and I took a graduate seminar in anthropology when I was actually at UW in Seattle. And it just made a lot of sense to me because it's so interdisciplinary. You can um, like, let's say I study contemporary Iran or that's what I've done for pretty much the past 20 years of my career. I mean, I'm moving in other directions, but so if you study Iran and you're studying, you know, like the cultural, political, cultural atmosphere, it's helpful to look at the literature and look at the films and look at how people are educated. And so I did all of that. And I, I honed in on college students and I looked at sort of how, how is their subject formation? How is their identity formed in a place that has a very sort of strict um, sense of what a political identity is? So that's, that's very broad <laughs> and also probably a little complicated. But I think... Um, I think I chose anthropology because it has the potential to be so multidisciplinary, but that doesn't mean that every anthropologist is okay with um, veering off course and doing more than just your ethnographic text. Yeah, well, it seems like it's such a difficult area too, because you know the current regime versus the past regimes, you know that that um, and certainly from the outsiders. I mean, a lot of students, a lot of a lot of people in general would have no idea of, you know, it's I mean, it's hard enough to know about, you know, your own history in your own country. And this right. kind of thing does seem very foreign. And, and in, a, in a sense, I think the dilemma is, um, is I think if you if you only get sound bites or you only have a flash picture or something like that, then you might miss some of these deeper issues or the people behind it, people who are really living through things. Right, exactly. Um, and so maybe you can tell me a little bit about, so you, examples of the different formats that you've been using to kind of um, get your ideas and have people experience them and, and think about them. Yeah, so I um, I started out, you know, traditionally, you know, getting the PhD and writing the dissertation, which is text, you know, and it's an ethnography where you go in and you sort of choose a thesis and you prove it and you, you know, describe things. And, and my thing was basically like if people who are in their 20s and grew up around the time of the revolution um, came of age and did not necessarily agree with the government, uh, at what point had the government failed in their project of creating perfect Islamic citizens and, ha and how did that happen? And so I looked a lot at like the public private divide and was public space, um, you know, a stronger indicator of, of cultural identity than what's happening at home and, you know, what's happening at school. And anyway, so I wrote this ethnography, my very first book, Warring Souls. It's going to be 20 years old next year, actually. Yeah. Thanks. But at the same time, I'm an incredibly visual person, which I think with the dyslexia makes sense. And I didn't put that together until much later, but I was really interested in how space was being created by the government through murals, how it was being counter created by people on the ground, like artists, underground folks. And I thought, how do you how do you write a book about all of this without, you know, either doing a coffee table book or or doing a film? So I had a camera with me. I um, filmed the whole time I was there. It was part of my project. I had a Fulbright grant and I put in the application that I was going to be filming. But it took years, you know, to learn how to edit film, to have the time to put all of the film edits together. And I did it all myself because I was doing it in Persian. You know, I would have had to find an editor who understood Persian and then translate it. And I ended up doing the subtitling, the editing, everything. So wow. I had to teach myself all of that stuff. So it took a good um, almost 10 years to then become a filmmaker, but I was using the same material. So that was sort of my first foray into, oh, this is interesting that this material has a different life in a different space. And when it moves into that different space, it can do different things. And it also has a different audience, which is becoming increasingly more important to me as I think more about accessibility and you know, people like you know my son who I've been teaching for the past 10 years is a homeschooler who needs things presented in a completely different format. 
So that was one of, so that impetus wasn't there because literally the film came out while I was pregnant with it. <laughs> so it was before he was even part of, part of the equation, but it became important to me to think about how material itself kind of demands its own form. Like how can you talk about visuals and not show them? You know, you can describe them, but I think it's important to also, you know, and also emotional like, connection. Yeah. Yeah. All of that. And you were saying sound bites, you know, we were seeing so much news, especially from Iran yeah. that had a very particular sort of spin on it. It was very dark. Everyone was veiled. You didn't see the other side. And, you know, the, the country, you know, the, the political um, leaders of the country loved that because that was the image they wanted to deploy as well. So I was interested as an anthropologist of getting underneath that surface that was created and showing something else. Was so it the, dangerous or was it, you know, um, were you worried about, you know, what the repercussions would be if you, you know, just filmed you know, it? I'm glad I did it when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> I went, you know, I went right from college to going to Iran. I wanted to learn the language. I hadn't been back since my family moved during the revolution. I lived with my uncle. I'm half American, you know, so I lost most of my language. I was just really young and brave. You know? <laughs> wow. And then I started my PhD when I was still pretty young. And so even, even when I went to do my PhD field work, I was still, you know, under 30 and crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I had family, you know, so I didn't believe the hype that it was dangerous in that way. And at that time, it wasn't as um, the stakes were much lower, you know, on the international, you know, now it's Iran is in a completely different phase. I, yeah. I, I won't go back now. I mean, that's the whole, I don't even talk about Iran publicly much. I'm very careful. Um, and that's a different story, but it's also been 20 years. So back then, the last time I went was 2012, and I made a film about my son and his kind of interfacing with Iran as a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that was interesting, too. And it wasn't meant to be a film necessarily, but it ended up that way. Um, and then other things I've done. So then the second thing I did was I wrote fiction. And I think part of that was just... Um, Again, it makes total sense to me. I was studying underground theater. I wanted to write a book about theater. I was engaged in literature. I started out in comp lit in my PhD. I wanted to be a writer from the time I was eight. So it just made perfect sense that I would write a novel. And, but And this, yeah, so it is, I mean, it's kind of interesting because, I mean, I, I find like when we've interviewed people, uh, a lot of dyslexic writers, well, there's some who are journalists, for instance, you know, which you could argue is a lot of, kind of visual reporting and things like that, recognizing when there's a really good story there and things like that. But um, but I just, I feel like novels, considering how hard it is to, to write often mechanically, that novels are the best format for a lot of people because you, otherwise it does become this preconceived notions. And, and I would think that they're just be so many of them. I mean, because a lot of people, I, I actually, um, in medical school, my roommate for a couple of years was a dental student who was um, Persian. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever, you know, really had much contact. And it's, it's such a different thing, you know, knowing someone as opposed to like, like the three seconds that you see. Yeah. yeah. And, and just, and also not understanding what the culture was like beforehand or anything like that. And just that whole context, because, you know, sometimes what's emphasized is, is really like cartoonish, you know, yeah. I mean, and, and that's the problem. And, um, and people will react strongly <clears throat> to these kind of really ignorant things. That's all I can say. I mean, and I could say I was, you know, I was, I think I was pretty ignorant too. If I hadn't had that experience that definitely, and that was only one person, you know, and, and her family, you get to know her family a little bit better too. But, but I, you know, I love that because um, a novel immerses you, you don't, you don't really, you know, you start empathizing or experiencing before you see yes. in some cases that's really valuable. And I just think about how dyslexic people, if they, if they can get past that point where it's, it's difficult to read and they get really hooked on the stories and the characters and the events, then it just, it sometimes uh -huh. really flows. Yeah. Because, yep. 
because theory of mind often is really strong with dyslexia. And so the novel is a particularly good form where you can actually see things from even a murder mystery, right? <laughs> see things from multiple perspectives and really exercise that that simulation ability that could be your superpower, but you know, it's not on a list of like, what are my talents is the thing, right. but it's a great thing because you have so much context. You already kind of um, often identify with people, even if they make mistakes in the novel. So I think that's really, really kind of neat that you do that. And so do you, as an anthropologist, because you talk to a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that, right. So that's probably a lot of it too. Just being able to see things from other people's perspectives and see where the tensions arise. That 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 um, that's kind of a neat neat I thing. Think, I think anthropology and fiction writing are very intertwined, and I think I made a very um, uh, a, a, it was a very um, what's the word for it deliberate deliberate move into anthropology because I I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I knew I couldn't afford to do an MFA and I knew that I needed to make a living. And so I was, I was very practical as I was going into grad school. And I thought, well, what field is going to keep me closest to being able to write? And I thought comp lit and I love literature, but then I, it, it started kind of ruining literature for me. I thought, I don't want to deconstruct and destroy. And you know, I was like, interesting. I, yeah, I see yeah. that. I can see that. Yeah. I yeah. Work. I mean, I actually, like, there's an analogy, there's an analogy for biologists, in fact, I mean, I'm, you know, where, you know, like, I think there was a quote about, you know, how, you know, I don't learn more about a flower by tearing it to shreds and pinning it, you know what I mean, you know what I mean? You know? but you can love flowers, right, you know, right, I mean? exactly. <laughs> And I just, but then I thought, you know, it, and it's, this is what I love about Agatha Christie too, is that it's, it's kind of, you know, novel writing is really about like what makes people tick, you know, at the core are the characters much more than the plot in certain kinds of ways. And so I thought, well, that's where anthropology comes in. You know, anthropology can help me be a better novelist. So I thought, you know, this, this will be fun. I had no idea that there were going to be so many like constraints and anthropology there aren't but it just depends I think on and that's something that my character really grapples with is it, are all the um naysayers but oh you can't do that and you're not gonna you know you're not you're not gonna get a PhD doing that or you're not gonna get promoted to full professor doing that or that doesn't count like constant constant trying to think outside of like what's there and outside of the box and constantly being told that you need to go back in the box you know um, but I think there's so much potential to bring anthropology out into the open. And especially during the pandemic, I was interfacing with, um, you know, a colleague who's an epidemiologist <laughs> and he would say, he's crunching numbers and he was like, yeah, you know, um, I think we're going in this direction and I'm watching everyone like refusing to wear a mask in Orange County, California. <laughs> like, I don't think that's, I don't think those numbers are going to be accurate if we don't pay attention to some of the human behavior over here. Like you can crunch those numbers, you can make your predictions, but I'm like watching just some anecdotal human behavior over here. And I'm not so sure about that. So I realized like we, we need more anthropology and we were, we were moving to zoom and people are using more visuals and I don't think they're always doing them very well. And, you know, they were, they were making a lot of guffaws like <laughs> in terms of like how they're presenting people or places and, and they're not trained in that. And I thought, you know, we could use some basic training in, in how to show visuals even, you know? Um, so I just thought it would be fun to do this crossover and publishers hate that, you know, they don't want an audience that's like both high school students, college students, PhD students, the general public, you know? So <laughs> it's like at that point too, you're just kind of like breaking out of that box, you know? Um, and then you're doing something really crazy by trying to put something, I think my only review was with Cozy Mystery and she called it entertaining and educational. <laughs> and she said some of it was over her head. And I thought, that's okay. That's okay. You know, it's okay to have layers of things, but we're, we're, we so want to be spoon fed things at the exact place where we think we need to be or where we are. And and I, I don't know, I think accessibility too is about like putting stuff out there in as many forms and hoping that some of it kind of falls and and, and has its effects. I don't know. 
So how uh, was the starting of this murder mystery? And and you were thinking about assigning to students. Now I I'm like I I think I, I said briefly beforehand, I initially thought, well, is this just like a a hobby? And the last thing I thought, I mean, I, it didn't occur to me that you would be assigning it to students. And then it made me wonder why. So that's a mystery. I'm the most utilitarian person, right? <laughs> Anything I do is good as an academic, you know? I am. So I don't really identify as an academic. I think because an academic would be like, what are you, what are you doing, you know? Um, but I also... You know, I uh, mystery writers would also be like, "What are you? What are you doing?" And it's funny. It goes back to, it goes back to. I I think I've been like developing my own genre from the very first thing I wrote. I wrote in undergrad. I wrote um, my memoir of going back to Iran, and I was on my year abroad in Cairo. And this wonderful novelist, Anita Desai, she's an Indian novelist, and she came and she um, visited our creative writing class. And she was kind enough to read some of what I was writing in this memoir. And I still have her letter. She wrote me and she said, you know, Roxanne, at some point you're going to have to make a choice. You're either a novelist or you're an academic. And she was like, but to put them both in the same place is to destroy one or the other. And I thought, or to give birth to something. <laughs> so I don't know, like maybe yeah. I'm the great like, destroyer. Wait a second, is there a novel, novel police? Wait a second. <laughs> but you know, it's like, you know, that was like, I was, that was 1991. And I think I was 21 years old, you know? And I, and I, sometimes I've looked back on that and thought, God, I should have taken her advice. Like, what have I been doing, you know? Or not, right? You know? Or not. Like, maybe, so yeah. maybe this will work. But, um, and you know, the second book, I really, in, in so many of my, you know, the novel writing, and I've written short stories that have been anthologized in Iranian American writing, and those are pretty straightforward short stories, but they come out of like these deeply ethnographic experiences. But, you know, both of the novels, this last one, which I think of as way more of a novel than my second book, which came out with Stanford University Press. So it was still academic enough. <laughs> it was peer reviewed and accepted in, you know, academia. But, um, they both started out as, and even parts of my first book have, you know, ethnographic short fiction in it, which is really unusual. And they come out of this place where I just sat down and started writing a novel. But then at the same time, I was doing intellectual work, and then somehow I put them together. So for my very first book, it was because I had writer's block, and I was working on martyrdom in Iran. And my advisor at Columbia was like, you need to come in and present what you're working on. You know, he's trying to kind of poke me into like getting going. And it turned out I wrote the book really quickly after that. But I came in and read some of the fiction and then I added all this theory to it to like you know, do what I thought he wanted me to do. And everyone loved the fiction. And and I and he said, you're going to put that in the book, right? And I said, no, I'm not destroying this novel I'm working on by putting it in my therapy. <laughs> I ended up doing that and not writing the novel. So it became, you know, a bunch of short stories and then some of it. And what happened was um, the people who read that felt like I really got it, something that isn't my subject position. I was writing about people who had gone to, to the Iran-Iraq war front, men, young men who wanted to be martyred and changed their minds. And um, a couple of them told me after reading it, like, wow, how did how did you get into our heads? Like, how did you understand our emotion? And I said, like, I spent a lot of time interviewing you guys. And they were like, but still you got it. Like you even like, it smelled like the war front. And I don't know, I just like, I have that, maybe it's an extra sensory thing that when I sit down and I talk to someone, I can immediately visualize it and, and go into that space with them. But um it's so important too, because I, I mean, when you think about something like that, it's, it can be so personal. And when you think about, if you really want to learn about something from a lot of different people's perspectives, if you limit it to the people who are willing to put their name in there and, yeah. and, and be part of this research study, then there are all these people who wouldn't want that and, and yeah. wouldn't speak honestly about yeah. it either. Right. Well, and so fictionalize them. Yeah. You're protecting yeah. them. And that was exactly. what happened with the second book is I was working on underground theater and I didn't want to get everyone in trouble, like hand them over on a plate, you know? And yeah. um, so I, I fictionalized all of it. And, yeah. and, you know, I've been, I've been studying creative writing on my own for years. I've been teaching it a little bit in class here and there. I've been reading Anne Lamont. I, I, 
I knew the basic tricks of the trade of, like, you know, if somebody's got brown hair, make them blonde, you know, like, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so I was able to do that. And it was a great way, I thought, of protecting. I felt like it was more ethical to write a novel in the second book than it was to be completely 100% upfront about who people were. Yeah. And, and that worked. And you know what? The students loved it. The students preferred it. They learned more. And then I wrote the play. That was the third thing I did, um, which is now becoming the graphic novel. And it was all this philosophy that I had in the first book, you know, Heidegger, Henri Corbin, all this stuff, Foucault, that just went over the undergrads' heads. The graduate students, when I taught it in a seminar, that was different. We could get into the philosophy, we could read it on the side, but with an undergraduate some, you know, um, class lecture, it was much harder. But when we read the play out loud together, they really understood like how the philosophy was deployed, why it was deployed in the way it was. And it just, it was completely different. We read it out loud together. And so they were kind of involved. And mm -hmm. I know reading out loud can be terrifying for some people. And so it was just a really great way for the people who didn't want to read out loud to listen yeah. and not have to read it themselves later. So it was a really like good, interactive, accessible way of, of doing stuff and being able to stop in the moment and say, did everyone just get that, you know, mm -hmm. instead of people at home kind of doing their things. So I felt like theater, you know, as a next step too, was just both um, incredibly gratifying. Somebody told me that um, writers with dyslexia love dialogue. And I have to say, like, I, I, love, I love writing dialogue. That yeah. is my thing. Like I could just be a playwright probably from here on out. Yeah, I, I, I think there was, uh, what was it? our daughter, our daughter, totally, totally, and, but she also had a lot of visual imagery, so it's easy to understand why, you know, she couldn't get into Dickens because he'd have these, like, whole pages of descriptions, like, <laughs> yes. I, I don't need this, I don't need this at all, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's so funny, and who was it, there was Redwall, which some people really get oh. into. Oh, my but son you know, loves red wall. <laughs> I know, but the problem was the descriptions. You know, I said, just skip the descriptions and look at the option. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And that might just be that kind of superpower, that dialogue, you know, and dialectical thinking. You know, I, yep. I was recently, I, I'm on this little newsletter to keep track of chat GPT. And I heard like this latest advance in AI is to be able to have more, more like, parallel strands of when you're talking that there there's more alternatives I think I thought that's kind of interesting trying to give it like a theory of mine but you know I'm saying this but at the same time I could be saying this so I thought that was kind of interesting because they're trying to they they're calling it a dialogical conversation where there's two different strands in a conceptual space that it's not single one 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 back. Yeah. I think that would be better, right? But I yeah. think an anthropologist, a really good anthropologist, does that all the time because you know you're probably thinking what you're saying, who's saying it, what the time and period is, the context, and and also what they're not saying. You yeah. know, so yeah. I mean, it's such a valuable thing to have, um, you know, a good ear for dialogue. For what people are, are saying and 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 not saying and and uh, and the personas. I mean, this also reminded me of because um, we're friends with Phil Schultz um, and his wife Monica Banks, the writer studio, and um, and Phil persona was so important to him finding a voice when he was a young person, and you know I think when he was trying to cover such a you know the horrendous event the Holocaust, he had to have like 40 voices running it at the same time and back and forth to try to cover this very human event. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of that talent can come from the dyslexic community because not everyone can do that, you know, and I it's agree. so important. It's so important. You know, news can get so incredibly narrow and people get siloed, you know, and there's nothing like a, a, a good play or a, a good novel to really kind of shake up perceptions and and have you think in different ways so and I'm hoping you know I think um this the murder mystery is going to be a series and also just having the protagonist um you know having dyslexia and ADHD and being able to develop that 
like in conversation with her her friends and the other people along the way through a series as she learns more is also really interesting just in terms of the human interactions that, that come about, you know, from yeah. fumbled misunderstandings or diffuse attention or, you know, your work was so helpful when I was writing, um, I wrote a field note on Miss Markle and just talking about how much um, Agatha Christie um, you know, how much of her dyslexic superpower she gives to Miss Marple, I think, you know, and how much of the detective superpowers are the dyslexic superpowers and the anthropologists. Like, I think that there's, they have a lot in common. You know, they sit, they listen, they observe, and then they sort of like try to come up with a theory of what's happening. And then what the detective does is the detective tries to determine what's going to happen next. And the anthropologist is always asked, especially if you work on Iran, what do you think is going to happen next? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. That's true. that's so cool. So, do you have a? Um, can you hold up the book so we can also? <laughs> Yay! Okay. So, what is the setup for the murder mystery? Oh my gosh! Well, it's kind of funny. Don't give anything away, right? <laughs> I'm not going to get. Yeah, it's so hard to do book talks on murder mysteries. I'm not used to that because of the spoiler. Okay, well, there. someone's murdered. We know that. <laughs> we know that someone's murdered for sure. Yeah, and and I won't. You know, if you read the cozy murder mystery review, don't read it all the way because it gives away way too much. Oh no! Um, okay, I think it's kind of strange for a mystery review, but. So it's kind of funny, like I really also, I, I deeply believe in serendipity and I, I believe in, you know, this whole Jungian coincidence thing and all of that. So just a really quick backstory because it really has to do with dyslexia and it has to do with like, you know, my son's interest versus my own. Um, you know, he's always been interested in paleontology and I thought the dinosaur thing was just, you know, every kindergartner loves dinosaurs and he'll get over it. I mean, we were, he was three when we were in Vienna and we were in the Natural History Museum and he could just, he could just, you know, tell you anything about any of these dinosaurs and people would stare at him. And I thought, well, it, it's a phase, but you know, he was, um, when did I start this? Maybe I've lost track of time and California doesn't help and neither does the pandemic. So maybe <laughs> five or six years ago, uh -huh. we were um, staying with close relatives in Bozeman. And of course we went to the Museum of the Rockies because he absolutely had to see the dinosaurs. So we're in the Museum of the Rockies and um, I teach visual anthropology and I'm also, without giving away too much, I, I teach a lot about photography. And so photography is a major theme in here and so is paleontology in certain kinds of ways. It's more of a backdrop, but photography is the real theme. And I, I'm sitting in this, you know, Mysora <laughs> exhibit and my son's going, blah, 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 did you do <laughs> And I was like, okay, all right, whatever. And then on the way home on the airplane, literally this murder mystery just popped into my head with a photographer about a nature photographer out in Yellowstone National Park. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, I'm going to sit down. I have one week left of a break and I'm going to start writing this mystery. And then I got really sick and I didn't write the ministry. I think it was on, on the back of a receipt. <laughs> the airplane. And I have dysgraphia. So of course I like could barely read. Like, my own. <laughs> I was like, what did a, I write? A fevered thought. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, thank God now for the notes app, you know, on the iPhone. <laughs> I just dictate everything. Um, so anyway, I, um, I came home. I didn't do much with it. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and I... I just got back into it because I didn't feel like doing anything else. I didn't even want to read. And so I just gave myself a word limit and I just played around with it. And, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to place it at the Museum of the Rockies and this graduate student's going to get this weird grant. She's a, she's a cultural anthropologist, but we're, we're always applying for money and then changing our projects to like <laughs> dinosaurs, you know? reminds me of academics. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, she's she she gets this weird grant. She goes to the Museum of the Rockies. She wants to work with a dioramist and do this really cool project with dollhouses. I was really influenced by Frances Glesner Lee, who I'm convinced was probably dyslexic, but that's another mm -hmm. story. Um, she did these murder houses. Um, and I'd seen that exhibit a few years ago. So museums are very generative for me. And I put it all together and I don't remember, 
I, I honestly did not remember reading that Jack Horner was dyslexic, probably until I revisited your book because I hadn't really thought about him or I didn't even look at the Mayasura thing very, very carefully. But as I was writing, I knew that my protagonist was going to be dyslexic and have dyslexia because I'd been, you know, <laughs> dealing with all of this with my son for 10 years. What I didn't expect was that she would slowly become more my kind of dyslexia in certain kinds of ways, but it, which is interesting. We can talk about that. But um, so anyway, I, I put it in, in, in the Mayasura exhibit and I started looking it up and I was like, that's Jack Horner. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh my God. So then, and he had become this character, this paleontologist who ran, ran the, the, the museum and um, I made him this affable guy. I've never met him, right? He's very affable. I, I, yeah, yeah, and I really liked, <laughs> liked him as the character. And I had, I'd started writing this, right? And um, But this is before the pandemic, actually. So yeah, I had like maybe 50 pages written before the pandemic that I'd been playing around with. And then my son went to this national eye-to-eye -eye program, which was supposed to be for high school students, but somehow he snuck in in middle school or no, he wasn't even in, uh -huh. in elementary school. And there's a great picture of him. I'll, I'll tell you later, no spoiler. But he comes home one day and he was like, where are my fossils? Where are my fossils? I was like, no, what, do, what do you need your fossils for at like the, you know, after school program for mentoring kids with ADHD and dyslexia? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And he's like, the faculty mentor is a paleontologist and I was like who's the faculty mentor and he was like his name's Jack Horner and I was like, what's he doing at Chapman University in California oh, yeah. and he was That's like right. they just Chapman. hired him and yeah and I was yeah, like yeah I was like mommy's driving you next week <laughs> show up for Jack I was like you don't know me I, I'm his mom and, but you know what I'm writing this murder mystery and you're a character and of course he's like good in Jurassic Park so he's just like whatever you know? but he was so nice it's and I so said nice. you know if I ever finish this could I come and get your permission and read it to you and whatever it takes and he's such a sure. that was like six oh, years ago lovely. Like, yeah, oh, that's great. That's great. So I went and read it out loud to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was just how I imagined him. So it was really crazy. And yeah, um, yes. yeah so he's the character, which, and so I was like, I must be on the right track. If like, here I am writing this protagonist who has dyslexia and Jack Horner's already <laughs> book it was crazy <laughs> and I thought, okay the universe is telling me to keep going yeah serendipity like you say yeah yeah Sometimes you don't know you think oh god I'm doing this crazy thing and maybe I should be putting my energies elsewhere and um, so so your students why would your students benefit by reading this because of the theory I think so I've been teaching visual anthropology as as a course both in the graduate in as a graduate seminar and an undergraduate seminar for years since I first got hired at um, the University of London at SOAS actually I started teaching visual anthropology and it's been my thing and I um, each book in the series is basically as, as I go toward retirement for like the next 20 years now it's going to be a different um aspect of anthropology that I teach so this one's visual anthropology the next one I it's going to be performance anthropology and then the one after will be religion and climate change so I have those three kind of the, the first three are kind of planned out but so I think it's a great way to introduce the topic without scaring everyone off and it has <laughs> enough it has enough um context that students can see how a graduate student would use some of these theories instead of just reading the theories. How and I cool always do yeah, project-based yeah. stuff anyway. Um, in class, they're always working toward either a video or a graphic novel, or they're doing something visual all the time. Um, but you know, I teach in the quarter system. So things are very quick and it's not a lot of time to do a project. And so this is a great way to sort of experience that without having to do it, or or you could do it. And then um, I had a graduate student who's a visual anthropologist who's read it and she was like, wow, we, you know, this should be taught in classes. And I thought, well, I'm teaching multimodal undergrad this quarter and I'm teaching the writing course. So I thought it would work in both. I can show, I always show the students in the writing course, like, okay, here's an op-ed I wrote about 
Iran, same topic. Here's a short story I wrote about it, same topic. Here's the novel here. You know, like here are all the different outputs. Yeah. The same <clears throat> research. The mm -hmm. same research can be outputted in these 10 different ways. And here's how I've done it. And now let's play. Um, so I thought I would introduce them to this as well, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But I'm excited for the multimodal class to read this because it's also about, um, about her as a multimodal anthropologist who's trying to put things in other spaces and output, and she's not really sure what she's doing. She, she doesn't have a whole lot of self-confidence because everyone has imposter syndrome. And I think people with dyslexia probably have it in spades, especially if they make it to, you know, the first year of grad school or the second year of the third year, <laughs> any point. Yeah, true. <laughs> and also true. even undergrad, I don't think it's, um, I toyed around with the idea at one point, especially um, when I started thinking about teaching it for, I wanted to, I was gonna teach it at this place that was gonna publish it for gifted high school students. And when I thought about that, I thought, well, maybe I should make her an undergrad. And so I started playing around with that and I changed her to an undergrad. And I thought, well, there's just not as much that I can do with her. Like she has a lot more freedom to do these, these things. Cause I am, I am constrained by ethnography. At the end of the day, I want things to be grounded as much in the real, like even as a reader, I want a reliable narrator. You know, when I'm reading something that has a little bit of history in it, I want to know like who is this person? What's their authority? Are they are they giving me I, I love that it's embedded in fiction, but is the stuff that's real is it is it accurate? So mm -hmm. I still want it to be accurate and I felt like I could do more with the graduate students. So I just kept her there. Then I started thinking about what what Agatha Christie said, which is she said, "I wish that I hadn't started with Miss Marple." being so old because I didn't realize I was going to keep going. <laughs> She's, like, She's oh, ageless, 130 or something. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm already thinking like I have all these ideas for my character. <laughs> well, like, junior faculty <laughs> member. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Or like, you know, what yeah. are the other career options? So now I'm thinking she's going to go through a bunch of different career phases, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, oh, which cool. is fun. I mean, it's fun because I can take her from her 20s to her 30s. And I'm just really excited about this. It's freed me. And I think also um, taking on all of the, all of the, every aspect of producing the book has freed me to do what I want with it as well. And um, I'm just super excited. <laughs>